Lukudi. Great afternoon. What beautiful sunny day we had. Taking in somewhat of a springtime weather. It's supposed to get cold again. Oh wait, the plow is still on. So I'm trying to like make it so with the plow on, it'll stay green. Our first selection tonight will be number nine, A Wonderful Savior. <clears throat> a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hide my soul in the cleft of a rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That shadows of dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings, each moment he crowns. And filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O glory to God, For such a Redeemer as mine. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock That shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand at this time we're going to have an opening prayer please pray with me heavenly father we are grateful that we have the opportunity to be here this evening to study to, to have your word explained to us, to study it together, to have fellowship, and uh, to praise your name, Lord. We thank you for the blessing that we have this opportunity today. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our next song will be number 48. <clears throat> Anywhere with Jesus. 
Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leaves me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over Jerry's ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea. Telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points the way. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the darkening shadows round about me creep, knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Our next song will be 288. <clears throat> I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need Every hour in joy or pain, come quickly and abide, for oh, life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless 
Jesus, me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. Next song will be 843. As a deer panteth for the water. One of my favorites. <clears throat> One of my favorites. I can't think of the tone. Start me out, but I'm sorry. As a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth to Thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You're my friend, and you are my brother, even though are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Our song after uh, Scott's lesson tonight will be 207. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord, so my soul longeth after Thee. My soul thirsts for the living God. My soul longeth after Thee. Lots of songs about thirst. Okay. Sorry, just running through my mind there. <clears throat> no, there's it's it's an alternate to uh, that's an alternate to that song. <laughs> All 
All right, Denise. You had a question during Bible study. Did you look it up on your own? What did you discover? Yeah, it's basically the gateway to Galilee. As you step into Galilee, that's, that's that area. So yes, definitely Jewish. Also, putting all your eggs in one basket could be used to describe that town. They, uh, they decided, because they had a bumper crop and it sold well, uh, they decided to, uh, this, the village is still there to this day, but they decided to sell Simsum. And uh, then the market crashed, and so now the place is kind of destitute. For those that don't know what Simsum is, it's sesame seeds. <laughs> wow, that's interesting, right? Uh, be careful what you, uh, how you arrange your uh, city's agriculture, I suppose. <laughs> sesame seeds, yeah. All right, I received a text message for a question uh, today. So, good evening, saints. I'm glad you're here. This is Stump the Preacher Night. The question that I received is this. <clears throat> uh, if you don't take communion and you die that week, will you still go to heaven? Let me read it to you again. If you don't take communion and you die that week, will you still go to heaven? I'm sorry, what? No? <laughs> oh, Patrick's jumping right on in here. He says no. Why is that? We're, we're going to assume a number of things. So we're going to have to assume that the question is about someone who is a Christian. Okay. Why would they not take communion? <laughs> All right. There's lots of reasons why people might not partake of the Lord's Supper. As, as was stated, some people work. Some people might be sick. Some people might not feel up to coming to service. So, what does the Bible teach about partaking of the Lord's Supper? All right. We have the example, not the command. We have the example to partake it of the first day of the week. That's Acts chapter 20, verse 7 and following. The command from Jesus to partake of the Lord's Supper is his body and his blood, that is, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. But any actual instructions about anything else kind of falls into 1 Corinthians 11 and not much else. So turn over to 1 Corinthians 11. There is a line in here by Paul that a lot of people misunderstand. Uh, and so because of that, some people will not partake of the Lord's Supper because they misunderstand what Paul writes here. Let's look at what he says. Chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 27. This is the verse that people misunderstand. Uh, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, what's an unworthy manner? What is, what is an unworthy manner that would profane the body and the blood of the Lord? Well, All right, that's the typical line that I hear, which entry just gave us. Uh, I'm getting there. Patience. 
So we are, inst we are instructed to partake it in remembrance, and uh, that's back in verses 22, 23, or yeah, 23 through 26 there, to partake it. And so some people don't feel, what was the word you used? They might not be able to clear their mind to partake of the Lord's Supper, and so they might not partake of the Lord's Supper because of that. So it has to do with making sure that your mind, your soul is in the right place before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, I'm going to disagree with that. I know that's common. It's very popular. I'm going to disagree with that, and I'll show you why in a moment. But Denise has her hand up, so we'll go with her first. Uh, yes, uh, speaking of pagans partaking, but that's we're looking at Christians. So let's keep our focus on the Christians. Hold on, I, I saw your hand, Bill. Go ahead, Glenn. You you had your hand up first. Okay. And they're not the only ones, but they're, yes. Right, if you ever see notes or uh, some congregation makes mention of it being a closed communion, that means if you are not a member of their congregation, sometimes they'll extend it to the church. If you're not a member of their church, then you cannot partake of their Lord's Supper. But that has nothing to do with the question at hand. <laughs> Bill, you had your hand up. <laughs> you don't say. Context, that might be important. Okay, that's the real thing that we everybody's not made mention of that's really important here. And And Paul, when he writes about Partaking of the Lord's Supper, it's very important. Verse 27, unworthy manner, guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. I don't want to do that, which means, of course, I want to take it in a worthy manner. What is a worthy manner? And, and again, a lot of times I'll hear lessons. Well, it's about you know whether you, you've confessed your sins before you partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, some who grow up in, in certain denominations or the Catholicism, for instance, you don't get to partake unless you've confessed your sins. Or uh, for, the, uh, for the Mormons, you don't get to partake unless uh, the, uh, I don't remember what the name of the leader is, but the, the leader of their group says that you get to partake, if you can imagine that. Uh, um, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, you don't get to partake unless you're of a certain group of people who are going to heaven. There's all sorts of rules out there for who gets to and who cannot and all of that stuff. And as Glenn pointed out, uh, closed, closed communion. Even in the church, there will be uh, groups that will practice closed communions. Context. <laughs> what does Paul tell us? Shall we read what Paul tells us? Let's do that. So back up to the beginning of the context for this, and that's verse 17 of chapter 11. And let's look at what he tells us the problem is with the church of Corinth and their partaking of the Lord's Supper. Look at what he says, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, that's not to say they're not eating the Lord's Supper. What he's saying is, you think you're eating the Lord's Supper, but you're really not. Why not? Verse 21, For an eating... Each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. What's the problem in, in Corinth? 
Okay, they're not sharing. They're not showing love for fellow man. What else? The right reason. What's the right reason? <laughs> okay, remembrance. But they would, I would argue, some of them would say, I'm doing it in remembrance, but, but the remembrance does not teach that I have to be sharing with somebody else. How do you know? Because what we've been reading, right? Okay, it's important for us to understand Lord's Supper is not about you and Jesus. This teaching makes it very clear. It's not about you and Jesus. It, it is the blood of Christ. It is the body of Christ. But it is about you and everybody else here. That's what it's about. Because Paul makes it very obvious. You say you have the Lord's Supper, but it really isn't. Why not? Because some of you are eating and some of you are not. Some of you are drinking and some of you are not. Is that how Christians are supposed to act? And the answer, of course, is, well, no. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? And people take that out of context. What is Paul's point? Paul's point is we come together for what purpose? To remember. If you want a meal, where should you go? Home. What is this about? Remembering. Together. So he continues in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, what's the unworthy manner that he's been discussing? It's not about sin. It's not about missing service. It's not about any number of things. It's not about not being a member of that congregation. Kind of. What is it about? It is about are you together with the people? Now that's, that becomes important because, for instance, if I go to, um, say, a Catholic service, and they offer the Lord's Supper, which they will do almost every service, including for baptisms, marriages, and funerals. If I partake of the Lord's Supper with them, what am I saying? I am with them. This is why I will not partake with them, because I am not with them. That's, that's very important. Now, some people practice closed communion because that keeps out those who are not us from partaking with us. There's nothing in here about, about that. This is something that each one of us needs to determine when we partake of the Lord's Supper. We, verse 28, which we haven't read yet. It's not, let the church figure out if you're worthy. That's not what he says. He says, let a person examine himself then. Who's got to figure out if I'm partaking of the Lord's Supper? This guy. Who's got to figure out if you're partaking of the Lord's Supper? You, not the church, not, not this body. Now, I have to, I, again, I have to examine myself. That's what Paul tells. Let a person examine himself, not to see if I'm sinless, because if that's the case, how much Lord's Supper am I taking? <laughs> Nothing, right? Why do we take, why do we come together to partake of it? Because that's the example, that's the command. It's really weird. There are people out there in the world, they're like, I don't need to go to service. I can do Lord's Supper at home. I get my own little cup of juice. And I'm at home. I can get my cup of juice. I can get my cracker. I can get a whole box of saltines if I want. I'm at home, right? But that's not Lord's Supper. Why is it not Lord's Supper? Because it's not with us. It's not with us. Now, if you're at home and you can't come to service, that's an entirely different story. But if you decide, I'm just going to stay home just because and I don't feel like it, I can just do my Lord's Supper on my own because I can go to the store and buy un unleavened bread and, and, and fruit of the vine. I can buy that. You're missing the point of Lord's Supper. Coming together. And, and verse 28 Examine yourself. I see you, Dave. Hold on. 
examining yourself, look at what he says in verse 20, uh, 28 and 29, because they're tied together. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, now it gets confusing because we're eating the body, but in verse 29, he's not talking about the body. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. That body there in verse 29 is not Lord's Supper body. He's talking about this body, us, the body of Christ. How do I know? Because eating and drinking, you don't drink the body. <laughs> you drink the blood, right? But he says anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Are you part of this group? Are you a Christian with them? Do you agree with their doctrine, with their worship, with their service, with how they live their lives, with their fellowship with God and with Christ, with all of those things? You have to figure that out before you pick up that bread, before you pick up that cup and drink and eat. Paul says, examine yourself. And if you're not examining yourself, not for sin, but examining yourself to see if I am part of this, then you bring judgment on yourself. That's what he's teaching there. Dave, you had your hand up. Go ahead. <laughs> Is God concerned with our intent? <laughs> These verses say that very thing, don't they? Now, now, that's not to say that we can just disregard the form. I intend to partake of the Lord's Supper. I'm just going to skip the bread, and we're going to have Coke instead of fruit of the vine. That's okay. My intent's okay, right? you got to have both parts, both parts, right? And, and it's easy. Most groups will have, Lord of the, uh, Lord, they'll have the, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Their intent will be messed up. Their intent in Corinth is messed up. And that's what that's what Paul is after here in, in Corinth. So you can't um, you can mess it up by having the wrong uh, materials there. That's a different issue. But the intent is very important. Dave is right. Okay, now it Paul doesn't write about those who miss Lord's Supper, does he? He's got nothing to say here about those who miss. He, he does say, if you're going to partake, do it for the right reasons. Do it the right way. And that is very, very important because they're eating unleavened bread. They're eating fruit of the vine or drinking fruit of the vine. And Paul says in verse 20, that's not Lord's Supper, guys. Why not? Because you're not doing it together. All right. What if I miss? What's the, what's the purpose behind the Lord's Supper? Remembering together the body given for you, the blood poured out. Would it be a sin to not partake of it? Paul doesn't tell us that. What he tells us is, check and make sure you're part of the body. Well, if I'm not part of the body, I'm not going to partake. Doing it wrong, look, look at what happens when you do it wrong. Verse 30. That is why so many, uh, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, verse 33, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home. So when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And about the other things, I'll give directions when I come. What those other things are, we don't know. <laughs> but when we come together wait for one another that's the goal so that we eat and drink the lord's body and blood together to remember 
his body given, his blood poured out for us. I'm, I want to, I've got my phone up because I want to look at the Greek here real quick. I want to see, uh, because my English Bible tells me this, this is my body, which is for you. And what I want to do is I want to read verse 24. I want to look at verse 24. And I want to see. Yeah, it's it's plural there. That is one thing the King James is good for. This is my body, which is for, let me go th- southern, you all, y'all, right? This is my body, which is for y'all. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. Hold on. All y'all? Yeah. Uh, this is my cup. And the new covenant is in my blood. This do as often as if you might drink of it. See the you there. There we go. Yeah. Again, it's plural. All y'all. In remembrance of me. This is this is what he's after. Now, when we miss, when we miss, and and it and it happens. Uh, uh, did you know Christians in the first century got sick? Some of them would even have to work and others would travel and they wouldn't be there for morning service or evening service sometimes. Paul doesn't say anything about that, does he? Why not? Because that's (laughs) that's the way life is. Well, yes, we're not together, but it's 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 not done on purpose. The 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 lack of being together. So when we get into when we get into asking these questions about missing the Lord's Supper, um, we're going to get into trouble when we start to ask questions about things that Jesus or the or the the uh, the other the apostles didn't give us instructions about. If I miss, am I sinning? What makes you think you are? Now, in uh, in the Gospel of John, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember where it's at. Hold on. In the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Chapter six. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Turn to John chapter 6. <clears throat> this is where the Catholics and even some members of the church will go to talk about the Lord's Supper. The problem is this. Jesus is going to talk about eating His flesh. He's going to talk about drinking His blood. He's going to say, verse 35 of John 6, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to Me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in Me shall never thirst. He'll go on and He'll say in verse 30, 53, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on My flesh and drinks My blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For My flesh is true food, and My blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on My flesh, drinks My blood, abides in Me, and I in Him. Now, Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Why not? Well, because Jesus just told them that they need to be cannibals, right? But the problem is, is... That's that's not what Jesus was saying. And that's the hard part. Jesus has misunderstood. And again, with within uh, uh, the Catholicism, it's really strong, but even within the church, there are some that believe this. I don't know if they come from Catholicism and they bring it in or what, but there are some members of the church that, that they'll read these verses, and if I don't partake of the Lord's Supper, then I don't have life and I'm not going to heaven. What is, what is Jesus teaching here in John 6? Is He teaching Lord's Supper? Is He? No. Of course not. All right, Joyce, because you answered. What is He teaching then? 
Okay, and you have to eat him. No. Well, then he sustains us when we eat him. No. <laughs> Hyperbole. J look back at verse 26 where the discussion starts. Look back at verse 26. Now, now this is not the beginning of the context because you have to go all the way back to chapter 5. I'm not going to do that to us tonight. But look back at verse 26 of chapter 6 where Jesus has this discussion and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. The Son of Man is going to give us food that endures to eternal life. Glenn's holding up his Bible. I make it spiritual all you want. Hold on. Hold on. This is, this is why when Jesus says you have to eat my flesh, that's bread, you have to drink my blood, that's fruit of the vine, the reason why we're going down this road is because they ate their fill of the loaves, right? The 5,000 that were fed, they ate their, their fill of the loaves. They had the, the, those fish that the, the child showed up with. Um, verse 9, the, the five barley loaves and the two fish, and, G, and, and they chase Jesus down the next day. There's, we want more, and Jesus is, no, no. you gotta, you got to look beyond that. What other ways do we receive eternal life? If I was to go somewhere else in Scripture, I want eternal life. Where would you take me? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Look at that. Did I have to eat Jesus? No. When He gives this instruction about food enduring to eternal life, the Son of Man will give you it's not his literal flesh, it's not his literal blood, and it's not Lord's Supper. If you want eternal life, what do you have to do? You have to bow down to Jesus and look to him for eternal life. He will give it to you, but you have to follow him. He's going to feed you. This is part of our uh, change in culture and society that we don't grasp. Kings are bad, they're horrible. They abuse their, their citizenry. They don't take care of them. All of that stuff, right? What you don't hear about is the fact that the kings were the ones who were responsible for making sure that their citizens were protected from other kings, safe from disease, and fed on a regular basis. That's what kings were supposed to do. Jesus, as king, he says here, Son of Man's going to give you eternal life. God the Father set his seal on him. He is going to be the king. And it's not the bread that you ate yesterday that he's going to give you. If they were to literally eat Jesus, he would turn into the bread that they ate yesterday, meaning this. If I, eat, if I ate literal flesh from Jesus, how long would that sustain me? Until the next time I, I physically get hungry, right? That's, that's not what he's after, is it? He wants eternal life. He wants to give us eternal life. And that is something that is spiritual, right? It's above, it's above this physical life. He gave them food, but that's because they were busy learning spiritually from him at that time. Right. So John 6 here is not about Lord's Supper. And it's, it's, not, it's not about sinning if you don't partake of the Lord's Supper either. Because it's not about Lord's Supper. Here he's directing his disciples, if you want eternal life, you have to come to me to get it. You get it nowhere else. John 17, 3. 
Mm-hmm. I'm going to back this up to verse 1 of 17 of John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Why does he say that? Because it's not about eating his flesh and drinking his blood in a literal sense. It's about knowing who he is. You have to take in his doctrine, his teaching in John 6, John 17. You have to know Jesus. You have to know the Father. You go over to Acts chapter 2. You've got to be immersed into Christ. Why? Because He is, as you read Acts 2, He is Lord, He's King, and Savior, Messiah Christ. That's part of our baptism. So all of these things are tied together and they have nothing to do with Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper is remembering the covenant Remembering his body, remembering the blood, those things are what we receive as a part of our salvation, the establishment of that new covenant. The example is given, and again, it's very important to understand this. There is no command, take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. It's not there, you can't find it. There's commands, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. That's a command. There's a command, as we read in 1 Corinthians, together we need to partake together. But the only time, the only place we can figure out about time wise is Acts chapter 20. So let's look at that really fast. There's not a whole lot to read there, um, but it's important to understand this is what the church was doing. And they set the example for us because they were the Christians. This isn't the command on when to partake of it. This is when they did it, and they set the example for us. If anyone's going to know when to do it, it's going to be the early Christians. Acts chapter 20, look down at verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, what had they done? They had gathered together, 1 Corinthians 11, with the explicit purpose of doing what? Breaking bread. And that's not just a meal. That is Lord's Supper, communion, whatever phrase you want to use there, that's what's happening in that moment. Paul's talking with them. He's going to use that opportunity to preach, to teach, however you want to phrase that as well. But they gathered together on the first day of the week. Now, if you miss it, this is, this is, the, this is what happens when you miss the Lord's Supper. If you miss it, you miss being with us. That's the significance if we miss Lord's Supper, we miss being together with each other. I don't think that that's necessarily a sin. I can't find that in Scripture. But I do find a lot of instruction in Scripture about we need to be together. I find a lot of that in Scripture. I find that a lot about being together, about uh, loving one another. As we read in 1 Corinthians, waiting for one another. We find submitting for one another. We find loving one another again and again. There's, there's so many one another passages in our Bible. That's what happens, though, when we're not here. Is we miss being with one another. Questions or comments about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I would I would uh, refer back to when Jesus' disciples are walking through the field plucking grain and uh, the Pharisees get on to him well you're working and you shouldn't be working on a Sabbath because that's what they're doing and Jesus comes back and he says the Sabbath was made for man our worship service is made for us it doesn't rule over us it is a moment for us to come together to worship together our God. It is built for us. So 
things are going to get in the way. Again, sickness, travel, work, you name it. Now, if you're, if you're using that as an excuse to be lazy, God's going to know the intent of your heart. That's where problems arise, right? That's where we're going to get into other issues. And it's certainly not going to be Lord's Supper that's going to be the concern. Mm. Right. Right. It, it does it comes back to attitude and the reason why you missed. Absolutely. And and again, um early church, they didn't have Sundays off. They would come together for service before work, work all day, come together in the evening after work. And then Monday they'd go to work and they work all day. And Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And Saturday. They would work all day Saturday too. And Sunday would come and they'd come to service and then they'd go to work. We have it easy. We get Saturdays and Sundays off unless, of course, we work for an employer that you know doesn't allow for such things, the service industries, right? The early Christians, they didn't have that. They didn't matter what jobs they had. They worked seven days a week. Whew, rough stuff. We got it easy. All right, any other questions or comments about, about that subject, that matter? It's a good question. Thank you for asking. I hope it eases your conscience some to look at what the Scriptures say. Good discussion. Thank you, saints, so much for your participation. Really appreciate that. I don't think we have anyone who needs the Lord's Supper tonight, but I also don't think we've got enough time for another question. So we're going to end early. Patrick's going to lead us in song of encouragement. If you need prayers and love, we're here to do that. Let's go ahead and stand. Patrick's going to lead us in song.
Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank You so much for this opportunity we've had to come and worship You again this evening. We pray that You'll be with all of those that were not able to be here, that You'll bless them and keep them safe. We pray that You'll be with the sick, the travelers, keep them safe as they travel, and the sick ones, we pray that You will help recover from their sickness. For those that are facing surgery, we pray that surgery will go well and they will have speedy recoveries. Again, Father, we thank you for this time together and we pray that you will watch us as we depart, keep us safe on our journey home, and that we might be able to go home safely and be that light in our community for you that others may know about you and that they might come and listen and hear the word as it is given. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I forgot to announce this earlier. My apologies. Maybe I'm not the guy to be telling such things. Uh, I got a call from Kim this afternoon. Her sister has been rushed to the hospital with an aneurysm. Um, they're not sure. Uh, they're not sure if she will survive. They think that if she does, um, she will be somebody else, which is weird to think about. But Kim's heartbroken, so um, she asked for prayers, and uh, I've I neglected to tell you guys my apologies. Um, like I said, I may not be the guy to tell such things, but uh, let's let's take a moment for uh, Kim and for her sister Kelly. Father, we thank you for for blessing us today with this day to worship and praise you. And uh, Kim is having a hard time, Father, and we know Kelly is as well. We pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses as they work with her as they um, try to resolve her 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 aneurysm and the problems that will arise from that, Father. Uh, we pray for good resolution. We pray that you would heal uh, Kelly, that uh, there would be a good outcome. We pray that you will ease uh, Kim's heart and mind. You uh, would watch over this family and bless them, Father. And, and as always, remind Kim, remind us, you are a good God. You love us greatly, and you have our best interest in mind, what is good for us. Father, we ask that you'd watch over Kim and Kelly and the rest of the Brooks family. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 